here in Europe, uh, good night. Good evening for those of you in Europe. Um, good afternoon, I suppose, to those who are in America. I'm going to be basing my lectures broadly on the material which I've distributed as the lecture notes. The may at points be stages where I throw in additional material that I have either prepared later or thought was necessary. And that, that will be the case in this lecture. There'll be some material that's not in the lecture notes. So I'm starting out with a talk about Turing. Um, let's shift to uh, put the screen sharing on. As I say, I'm starting out with a talk about Turing and It'll be relatively introductory, but we'll focus on aspects that if I were teaching it to computer science students, I wouldn't focus on so much. It'll focus on the more philosophical implications of what he was doing rather than the technicalities of what he was doing. So the outline of this is I'm going to talk about the process whereby people stopped thinking of logic in terms of reason and moved to a process of talking of logic in terms of a formalism. Uh, I will then talk about what Turing thought marks to be, maths to be, which the Turingist uh, conception of maths is one that uh, my colleague Greg Michelson and I pursue strongly in our publications, that maths is a material process and Turing catalyzed or specified that for the first time in a very clear way. And he did that by means of his hypothetical machine, the Turing machine. The Turing machine was invented as a thought experiment in order to solve an outstanding problem in mathematical logic, the decision problem. And I will therefore touch on the halting problem, which was the way Turing refocused or rephased that uh, concept in mathematical logic. Um, at that point, I will go across to new material that uh, is not included in this, these notes and spend some time talking about why the digital character of the Turing machine is important uh, and what implications that has for a materialist conception of the world. I'll then show that the Although it might appear something relatively separate, the work which Turing did during the war on code breaking is related to that. And very briefly, I will talk about his um, idea that machines could think or could in principle think. Now, in classical view, so, reasoning as a faculty, something that humans could do or that the human psyche or soul could do. And it was the presence of reason in humans that distinguished us from animals. And there were recognized to be rules for correct reasoning and, and Aristotle is the most obvious person who laid these down and it was held that reasoning was something could be taught. So reasoning was seen as something inseparable from the nature of humans and something which distinguished humans from everything else, though it was hypothesized that the gods might reason as well. Now reason was still at that 
still was thought of as something to do with thought. And the transition point comes with the Irish mathematician Boole in the 19th century, who published his book, The Laws of Thought. And it's rather surprising if you come to the laws of thought as a computer scientist, because you expect it just to be on what we now know as Boolean algebra. But the title says what he thought it was. It was how he thought processes actually had to operate, how he believed thought processes had to operate. And he believed essentially that they operated in what later 19th century logicians would call set theory. So his um, Boolean logic was a logic of essentially of predicates and sets. But his innovation was to show that these could be treated mathematically. He says, let's conceive of an algebra where the symbols X, Y, Z, et cetera, admitted differently the values zero and one. And these values alone, the laws, the axioms, and the processes of such an algebra will be identical in their whole extent with the laws, axioms, and processes of an algebra of logic. So he's establishing an equivalence between what had previously been seen as two distinct disciplines, that of logic and thought, and that of arithmetic. And of course, the logic he invented, the Boolean logic, is the basis of all modern computing and all data processing subsequently. So insofar as uh, correct ideas are proven by practice, he clear, clearly had the correct ideas. There's a mistake in this. Um, basically, he's saying true is one, false zero. Um, and is equivalent to a multiplication, uh, and or is a variant of plus. Um, my mistake is, is saying one plus zero is zero. It should be one plus uh, zero is one, obviously. The, it's modular arithmetic because he says that one plus one is one. So it's arithmetic of a, a bounded or saturate, what we would now call saturating arithmetic, that it, it can't go above a certain value. During the, the 19th century, starting on from Bull, techniques were developed to express any logical proposition in terms of an algebraic or mathematical formalism. So you can say for all A, for all B, um, a or B is equivalent to not, not A or not B. And this means that within the context of formalism, reasoning then became the same as manipulation of symbols, a form of calculation. And this is something that Leibniz had, had alluded to as a possibility but didn't in fact himself um, push it very far. The, Jeevens, who's best known uh, as an economist, actually developed a, a, what he called a logical piano, um, which was a, an electrical device for logical arguments. So from the formalization of it in the 19th century, people very rapidly started to move to trying to think, how could we turn this into to a mechanism? So we have a formalist project, a formalist project started with Bull and something which seemed to be very powerful. And therefore it started to be seen as a potential basis for mathematics in general. Boole was saying, okay, we can for, form logic on arithmetic, but then the, the question is raised, 
Could we in fact do it the other way around? Could we establish arithmetic and all branches of mathematics on logic? So that this is uh, Russell's, pro Russell's project. And could you use logic to, firstly, could you found all mathematics on logic? And secondly, could you use logic to deduce any true mathematical proposition? And a third variant of that is to say, can, you can the truth or falsehood of any mathematical problem be determined by purely formal means? Um, and this was Hilbert's problem, Hilbert's decision problem posed in 1928. And there is a slight ambiguity of, of what he means by formal or mechanical means. Um, he's talking about someone who does arithmetic doing essentially purely mechanical work one which doesn't, didn't require any deep thought. Uh, the simple application of rules that they've learned. So he's asking, can the truth or falsehood of any mathematical pro proposition be determined by a simple finite set of rules of deduction and inference? So that's the problem, the context of, in which this is posed. It's, it's worth looking at what people meant by mechanical in the late 19th, early 20th century. For instance, uh, you're, you're probably familiar with the opposition that Engels expresses to mechanical materialism and says dialectical materialism is something better than this. But that opposition to what was seen as mechanical was widespread in continental or German thought um, due to the influence, I think, of Mach particularly, but it was based in a long standing dispute about whether the mechanical theory or mechanical concept of the world, which was seen as the concept put forward by people like Thompson and Maxwell, um, whether this mechanical concept of the world was adequate or um, you needed something beyond a mechanical concept of the world. Now, this came to a big crisis in the first years of the 20th century. And in the context it was originally posed, which was the context of physics and the context of the theory of heat, it was resolved by Einstein. But the negative con um, connotations of mechanical continued. And here we see it being posed by Hilbert um, some 20 years after Einstein resolved the argument in favor of the mechanical philosophy. So, what Turing did is he showed there's no solution to Hilbert's decision problem. And to do this, he developed the idea of the universal computer. And in doing so, this conceptual innovation has totally transformed how we understand computation and reasoning in the period after that. The, the results were not immediate. But by the 1950s, they were very evident. And he did all this at the age of only 24. Um, for this, you can look at the essential Turing chapter one. In order to understand what he did, we have to look at how he defined what maths was about. He said that hu human mathematicians are limited they are only capable of observing a few symbols at once. And this is obviously the case. You, you can't take in an entire sheet of paper full of maths symbols. You have to focus in on a small part of a formula. 
You have to focus in on a few figures if you're doing arithmetic calculations. He also says people have a limited internal memory or state of mind. The, there are lots of psychological experiments which test how long a string of digits a person can be told and accurately repeat. And it's quite short, maybe seven digits or so. Um, so our buffer of well, using post-Turing terms, our buffer of symbols that we can operate on is quite small. So both of those are undoubtedly correct statements about human potentialities and human ability. He also says that any mathematician or any school child has a learned set of tricks and rules of thumb, which are inculcated in the school child when they learn their times tables. They're inculcated in the older student as they learn a set of standardized formula for integrals, etc. And this is most important. He says, mathematician must be assumed to have a pencil and paper to write things down. Because unless you have that, you're limited to what you can do by mental arithmetic, which is not so great. Obviously, there are some autistic prodigies who could perform prodigiously long multiplications in their head, but this is very rare. And in general, that's not the basis that people work with. So what's his idea of maths? He, start, he starts off essentially from the idea of the maths you're taught at school, where you have squared paper and you write figures on the squares. So if you want to, you're taught at school, if you want to add 13 to 28, you put them in squares, underline them, and you add three and eight. And that's a learned rule of thumb. The learned rule of thumb that you're taught in the second year of primary school, that three plus eight is 11. You, you just have to say three plus eight and the answer comes out in your mind. It's been inculcated into you. You're then taught a rule for how to write these down on the piece of paper. You write a one underneath the, the line and you write another one at the top of the, the second column. You can then repeat the process. Now remember, we only looked at two symbols. We looked at two symbols and our mind came up with the answer. So you now look at another two symbols, the mind comes up with the answer too. We don't bother to write that down because we can remember one number like that. We look at the next symbol, two plus two is four. We write that down. So this is what he says is the essence of what people doing mathematics are. And it's the same if you're talking about algebra. So we start off with an initial formula, x into a plus b. The first state of the transformation is an internal state of mind where you remember that you're multiplying by x and that you've read the letter a. So you write x a. You then copy the plus. Looking up, you copy the plus. You then read b and you still remember that you're dealing with x. So you can write x a plus x b. At each stage, you only remember a little and you keep looking at the formula to deduce the next thing to do. Now, all this is obvious, but it was so obvious that mathematicians didn't really remark on it. These limitations of the, the human mind were not noticed. And there tended to be an exaggerated idea of what the human mind was capable of, even though the actual atomic steps that mathematicians were doing were as simple as this. So he reasoned that if in principle you could build a machine 
that could detect a small number of symbols at a time, that could have a finite internal memory or state corresponding to this, the finite number of states of mind, which he said any mathematician works with, and have a set of rules of thumb, which he said you can write down these rules of thumb in a table in the read-only memory of this machine. And finally, the machine must have something equivalent to the pencil and paper, which is a read-write memory to record the calculations as they go along. He argued that if you had such a machine, it could do all that a mathematician could do. And if you could prove that there were limits to what such a machine could do, there were no steps that a human mathematician can carry out that weren't already included here. So a proof about what the machine could do was also a proof about what the mathematician could do. And in fact, if you build computing machines, you very rapidly build ones that can do all these calculations far faster and more reliably than a human mathematician. Now his first machine was hypothetical and he didn't actually build it, but it's not inherently hypothetical. People have subsequently for didactic purposes built replicas of the machine he proposed. And this is a recent practical implication. Uh, notice what it's using. It's using a reel of 35 mil film, um, clear film. It has a mechanism here for writing and reading symbols. And the, there are motors which can move the tape backwards and forwards and have it re reeled on or off onto one of these reels. Now, that looks a real Heath Robinson sort of machine, but it remains canonical because it's one of the simplest models of a general purpose computing machine. So let's look at it in more detail here. You've got two motors, one which moves the, the film back and forth, and another motor which can bring a print head into position. The print head could, can either have an eraser or a inked part of a roller. And there is an electric eye which can inspect the um, film. And all during simplified, the whole set of symbols that mathematicians use to just a mark or no mark, a one or zero in Boolean terms. So you've either got marked squares or blank squares. And his argument was, this is general enough since it was already well established that you could have um, a numerical system other than decimal, so binary number systems were well established. The, it's relatively fanciful, this mechanical thing, but you, you have a program which you have a set of possible current states, uh, current state A, B, C, etc. cetera. Um, for each current state, it has an action depending on whether the current symbol under the head is zero or one. And the actions are composed of three things, whether you, what symbol you write, whether you move the tape left or right, and what the next state you go to. Now, that simple set of rules has been well established as being adequate for general purpose computing. And in a simpler way, or sorry, in a more complicated way, if you look inside any modern microprocessor, you find something equivalent to this table of rules. Um, it would be called the microcode or the, the program logic array. And you have something equivalent to the tape, which is the random access memory. Ran making it random access 
speeds everything up, but doesn't change the basic principle. So the conceptual model he presented was you've got a set of rules in the, your read-only memory. You've got a head uh, which can traverse the tape and you feed into it a program followed by data. Now, this is important because he showed that you can have a general purpose or universal program in the rules table, such that it can interpret any other program, including interpreting a program which is equivalent to itself. And this ability of a computer to emulate another computer was hypothesized by Turing right back in 1936 and is a standard theme of computer science ever since then. So that nowadays you can have people on um, a modern PC and the modern PC can emulate uh, another model of computer, a, an, an old Atari computer from the 1980s and can then run the games from the old Atari computer. But in doing that, they are just applying this principle of general purpose emulation. And what Turing was saying is once you reach a certain complexity in your rules table, then you can emulate any other machine, including your, yourself. And he proved this by exhibiting a particular machine which was capable of emulating itself or any other machine. Basically, it could emulate something which started off with a set of rules and then had data. And this idea, or this model of computation, was the model of computation which dominated 1950s computing. 1950s computing machines held most of their data on tape. They had a, a relatively small um, table-driven set of operations in internal memory, and the data processing occurred between the tapes. Now, th there was a th there's soon developed a theory of multiple tape Turing machines to, to handle more complicated problems, but this actually was how commercial data processing worked. And instead of using um, paper tape with an eraser, they use magnetic tape, which is much easier to erase. But that the, the same essential principle was being applied. Turing never actually built a machine of that type. He did, by the 1940s, start working on a machine, and his machine is in the Science Museum in London. And instead of tape, he actually used mercury delay lines to store the information. By modern standards, it's a very odd and ultra simplified instruction set machine. If you're, those of you are familiar with assembly language programming, it's essentially a machine which has only got move instructions, which can move data between arithmetic units or between areas of memory, and everything is a move instruction, which is just about the most minimal basic table you could have. And he, his machine with just these move instructions was capable of general purpose computation. The mercury delay lines were widely used in the 1940s, early 50s, as a way of storing information. Basically, you stored the information as acoustic waves. Now, how does this relate to reasoning and proof? Well, it's clear nowadays that any system of mathematical rules or axioms can, in principle, be written as a computer program. And a computer program can equally be thought of as a, a particular set of rules or axioms. And what he says is, Hilbert is concerned as to whether a particular axiomatic system is adequate to prove theorems by purely mechanical application. Well, we have the purely mechanical application in our 
rules system and we want to in our general purpose universal computer universal set of rules we want to feed it with a particular set of axioms and then a theorem and we want to say can those set of axioms be used to prove the theorem so the decision problem amounts to whether the axioms will halt on the theorem and cast in computing terms, will a particular program, the program that is this set of axioms, halt on a theorem? Because there's always the possibility that the computer will never stop. It may go around into infinite loops. And we want to say, can we show that a computer, given the axioms and a the theorem, will halt with a true or false answer. So this is one level up from applying the axioms to the theorem. We're making a meta statement about, can we show that the whole computer, given the axioms and the theorem, will halt with a true or false answer? Because if we can show that it will halt with a true or false answer for any set of axioms, then Hilbert's conjecture would have been proven. What Turing showed was that it's impossible to have a general procedure for showing if another program will halt. You can't have one program which will prove whether or not a second program will halt in all circumstances. Because he had previously established that axiomatic systems and programs were equivalent, it follows that the decision problem set by Hilbert was unsoluble. Now, I'm going to give a very simplified symbolic representation of this, um, drawn more from the, the versions of the halting problem given by Chaitin than by Turing, because it's easier to explain it in a modern computing language than to explain it in terms of the, the states on a, a, a Turing machine tape, which is really hard to follow. Suppose there existed um, a, a program, HALT PI, which will return true if program P halts on input I. In other words, this is the decision problem solution. Halt is something which answers Hilbert's decision problem. It says, given an axiomatic system P and a theorem I, will formal mechanical means cause P to halt on I? Let's then define Z, which is of the form, if halt is applied to X and X, where X is the parameter to Z, then loop forever, else halt. And that's a perfectly valid formula. What happens if we run Z, Z, Z? The two cases consider program Z halts on input Z, in which case halt will return true on input ZZ. If we go back, it will return true on input ZZ. Hence, program Z must loop forever on input Z. So we have a contradiction. The alternative is that the program Z loops forever on input Z. Hence, halt must return false on input Z. And hence, um, the program halts on input Z, which is again a contradiction. And this contradiction is brought about by the assumption that such a program that would answer the decision problem, such a program halt could actually exist. Hence, the conclusion that halt cannot exist. And therefore, the decision problem is unsolvable. 
in the general case. This doesn't mean you cannot, in particular cases, take a, a computer program and prove its correctness. It means you cannot have a general purpose system for proving all programs correct or incorrect. It sets limits on what we can achieve by mathematical reasoning. And it indicates that there can't be a general way of seeing if arbitrary mathematical formulae follow from axioms. And therefore, it sets limits to reasoning which would not have been apparent prior to this point and sets limits on our ability to prove the correctness of software. As I said, it doesn't prove there are no provable results in maths or no provably correct software. It means there's no general method of achieving all this. Now, I'm just going to deviate here to cover some other notes that I've prepared. Can you see the new slide? I hope so. So I'm going to, f I've been talking about the universality of his machine. I'm going to talk now about why the digital aspect is important. So the point is, there's now a growing conception that reality itself is digital. You've seen this most um, explicitly in the work of people like Wolfram and Deutsch. But let's look at this in more detail. I'm quoting Turing now. That the machine is digital, however, has a more subtle significance. It means first that numbers can be represented by strings of digits that can be as long as one wishes. One can therefore work to any de desired degree of accuracy. This accuracy is not obtained by more careful machining of parts, control of temperature variations and such means, but by a slight increase in the amount of equipment in the machine. To double the number of significant fi figures would involve increasing the amount of equipment by a factor definitely less than two, and would also have some effect on increasing the time taken each job. This is in sharp contrast with analog machines and continuous variable machines, such as the differential analyzer, where each additional, additional decimal digit necessitates a complete re redesign of the machine and increases the cost by a factor as much as 10. He's talking about the way people did computing up to him, his invention, where there were machines called differential analyzers, which were used by mathematicians to solve integration of differential equations. And these basically involved rotating disks and drums, which uh, could be, and wheels, which could be slid over the disks to perform multiplication and accumulation. And they required extraordinarily precise mechanical machining in order to get accuracy. Turing's argument here is very pragmatic. And there has been a temptation, uh, there's a recurring temptation to think that we can revert to analog computing and in some way outperform digital computing. Uh, I think this is almost certainly a false argument. It's based on bad philosophy. It's based on a philosophical misconception that in reality, everything is continuous. But we know this is false. Everything is actually digital or quantized. The real world is digital. The notion of the continuum arose in classical Greek geometry from the proof of the irrationality of the length of the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle with unit sides. If one assumes, as the Greeks did, that classical geometry is a true theory of the re real world, this result of Pythagoras implied that space itself 
must be continuously subdivisible. That there must be a possible infinite infinity of getting things smaller, 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 and smaller. But it's, is it even possible in principle to actually check if Pythagoras's theorem works in the real world? Could you experimentally test it? Could you experimentally test whether the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle with unit sides was an irrational number? You can construct proofs of that using idealized uh, concepts of lines and length in idealized Euclidean space, but is that the space that we really live in? Consider an experimental setup to test Pythagoras' theorem. I've got a figure there, which I'll show you in a moment. Suppose we've previously measured the length of the two sides of a right angle triangle. Uh, let's just show you the, the, the figure again. Here's the, the setup. It's interferometry setup. You have a laser. Um, you've got two 45 degree, two uh, angled mirrors so that you have a path from there to there. You have a half silvered mirror so that any photon has a 50% chance of following that path or following this path. And you have a detector here. And if there's an integral uh, number of photon paths around there, you will get constructive interference. If, if there is a half integral number, you'll get destructive interference. And in between, you'll get uh, some mixing, but not complete in destructive and in, um, or constructive. Now let's uh, just go back to here. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I'm, I need to zoom in here. Zooming in doesn't seem to be working. Um, so there are all sorts of practical problems with this. Suppose we measured the A, B, and A, C and established them to be an integral number of wavelengths. Can we actually measure this distance, A, C, B, A, and find that it's not an integral number of wavelengths. If you found it was, then we would have shown that root two was a rational number and that Pythagoras' theorem didn't hold in the real world. But there are also some practical problems to doing this. Um, you can't simultaneously measure BC and AC because of mirror orientation. And more significantly, how do you ever set the thing up to be at right angles? The standard ways we use to set up something at right angles are on the basis that we assume Pythagoras' theorem. The standard way to construct a right angle is to use the um, a set of sides which will meet Pythagoras' sum of squares criterion, a three, four, five triangle, for example. So it's almost impossible to see how you'd actually test this, except at cosmological scales. And at cosmological scales, we know it doesn't apply. Well, we know that the space is not such that Euclidean rules generally apply, but that doesn't uh, mean that in the real world, is there such a thing as root two? Is there such a thing as an irrational root two? So, sorry, I, I've got to get control of this. More generally, we've got a problem as a fundamental limit to spatial accuracy set by the Planck length, which is about 10 to the minus 35 meters, which 
And this is going to set the fundamental limit of any analog devices. And if you come across proposals for uh, trans Turing computing or hypercomputing, almost all of these are based on the illusion that real numbers are real in the ontological sense. They set up some form of calculation which makes sense if you take the Euclidean or Pythagorean idea of real numbers, but that is not evidence that it would work in the real world. Other examples of where people want to transcend um, Turing involve con other continuum models, either solutions to Maxwell's equations under certain circumstances or um, types of Newtonian mechanical computers. But if we take the post-Turing form of um, ontology or epistemology, you have to recognize that theories like Maxwell's equations or Newtonian mechanics are in a sense a software package for making predictions about reality. And they don't do anything until they're combined with some kind of computer that can do the maths that allows us to build models that mim mimic some part of reality. Newton's laws don't mimic reality. It's Newton's laws plus some way of performing the calculations on the observed positions of the planets, whether it was done by hand in Newton's day or was done by a computer nowadays. But uh, like any analog um, model, there are limits to the accuracy of our software packages, and our software packages aren't reality itself. So you can't assume that because Newtonian mechanics says you could do something that goes beyond Turing, that that implies that the real world will allow you to do that. Now, suppose we take some continu continuum model of mechanics and we show the system with computable boundary conditions has some points in the space where the parameters, let's say the parameters of the um, electromagnetic radiation are uncomputable. Does this tell you that the real world can do things which go beyond what Turing says can be done? By uncomputable, I mean parameters which no Turing machine could compute the answer to. Does this mean that the real world does things that Turing machines can't do? No, what it tells you is that the software package or physical theory that you're using of the world may have a bug in it. And it's just such a bug in Maxwell's equations uh, that led to what's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And from this, Einstein went on to invent the quantum theory. So assuming that a certain physics formula which is founded on continuum mathematics, gives you an answer to something, is not a, a safe answer or a safe assumption to make about the real world. And the conclusion I would draw is because of quantum effects, reality is in a sense digital, and that therefore during computability is unlikely to ever be transcended by any analog computing device. Now, I've said that reason moved from a faculty of the soul to a formal process with Bohr. With Turing, it becomes literally a mechanical process, something done by machines. What has happened here is that it is established an entirely material foundation. It's no longer something ideal, something of airy spirits. Let's look at how this applies to something practical that he did in the 1940s. How does the decision problem relate to code breaking? Well, you've probably all seen pictures of the Enigma machine, which was a, originally a commercial um, encryption machine, which was adopted by 
uh, the German armed forces. And it was basically a multiple um, substitution process. Now, it's well known that if you use a Caesar self uh, cipher, which is just a, a letter substitution, it's very easy to break by, by frequency analysis. But what this did is every time you press the key, it used a different substitution. Uh, it changed the substitution as you went along. And this made it much harder than the Caesar uh, code. What it has is rotors with the letters written on them and a set of contacts which go in a, a jumbled fashion, one to one between contacts on this side and contacts on that size. And every time you press a key, the wheel rotates so that the substitution between the letters changes. You're using a different substitution on every letter. And by that, you might be able to break it. But the problem is, it was fed through three of these rotors in succession. So that a letter sent a sig the letter A might set a send a signal which is jumbled once, jumbled two times, jumbled three times, and then jumbled another time by a fixed reflector and might give you the letter G. But the second time you pressed A, you don't get a G, you might get an, a C this time. So it's very hard to, to work out how on earth you're going to break that. It's basically the mechanism was like a car, an old car myelometer. Every time you pressed it, the right rotor moved by one. When that had moved 26 times, the middle rotor moved by one, etc. At the start of the day, you set letters on the, the dial there, which is the starting positions of the wheels. If you knew what these day settings were, and you have a copy of the machine, then you can decode any message. And the people who are sending the message and the people who are receiving the message have a code book which says for the 7th of October, the code is RDK. So the person sending the message and the person receiving the message sets their machine to RDK. For another day of the year, they have a completely different set of letters. So unless you know these three letter codes, you can't tell what has encrypted the message. How was this breakable? Well, certain ships and weather stations sent out messages each day with a known starting sequence of, of messages of letters. So, Wetter für die Nacht might come out from a weather station. And this was known as a crib. Now, let's look at this in terms of Turing's decision problem. The decision problem determines if axiom A leads to a theorem D. In the Turing, we can write that as D, A goes to T. In the Turing machine, both of these are numbers and both are on tape. The equivalent decryption was to decide if a setting C and a crib, sorry, a setting S and a crib C produced a ciphertext T. So you're saying, does SC generate T? And for that, you need a computer model of the Enigma machine, which he constructed. And it did parallel se searches on settings until it came up with one which correctly inserted it. And I've uh, considerably simplified the details here. There are other things involved. There are other things in that involved to make sure you can do a quick mechanical check as to whether you've deciphered it. Is what's coming out sensible German or not? And that's done by statistical analysis of the the frequency of the letters in the output at the, the end. But that can be mechanized. So what's the lasting impact of this? Well, obviously, the first is this idea of the universal digital computer. 
the universal machine, he says a digital computer is a universal machine in the sense it can replace any machine in a very wide class. And in this sense, digital computers are like human workers. We are, in CapEx terms, universal robots. We can, given time and numbers, do any work. Universal robots obviously just meant in check universal workers. Uh, CapEx um, play, Rossum's Universal Robots, was playing in London around the time Turing wrote his paper. This universality explains the potentially huge economic impact of the digital computer and how it has transformed the world economy since he came up with the idea. Beyond that, there's the whole field of what's now AI, which sprung from suggestions by him. He, he argued strongly that computers can be made to learn. He argued that in principle they could think and that in due course, they would be able to converse with us in ways that are indistinguishable from conversing with a human being over a digital channel where all you can do is type in messages. Um, on the issue of whether a machine could have feelings, he says, well, you've got no more philosophical basis to deny that a machine has feelings than you have to deny that another person has feelings or no more reason to assert that another person has feelings than you have to potentially deny that a machine has. I would suggest that for further reading, you look at um, Copeland's biography of Turing and almost any of the books by Gregory Chaitin, um, but the, the unknowable is a good introduction to the, these areas. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I think that's one hour now covered, so, or almost an hour. So I'm open to people asking questions. I don't actually see anyone even. Does anyone want to ask a question? Yeah. Unmute, unmute, I'm, Bryn. I'm mind asking a question. I'm I'm still thinking about this uh, test of Pythagorean uh, theorem that you laid out with the yeah uh, with the laser, and um, I'm I, I just I guess the second point that you had there that you cannot know that you have a right angle unless you're using the Pythagorean theorem, and um, I'm I'm just curious. I'm trying to think about like the um, like sort of having like a, for instance, just like something that measures degrees and like what the math would be in relation to how that would be formulated. Um, because uh, like what would be the relationship between the Pythagorean theorem and then also just having like a measure of degree. Okay, how do, how do people set up measures of degrees? It, the, Pythagorean theorem and Euclidean geometry gives you a method of set, constructing right angles. It also gives you a method of subdividing an angle into e two equal angles. So you can arbitrarily subdivide angles. So uh, measuring things in that sense can be done, but any practical machine for measuring degrees is relatively inaccurate. It's done. If you take a protractor, you can only measure a degree to the thickness of the little lines 
at the end of the protractor. And this yeah. is the point um, Turing is making about any analog machine is constrained by the mechanical accuracy with which you can cut it. Right. Now, people can do astonishingly accurate measurements of distance nowadays. They can, the gravity wave detectors um, can measure distances along a right angle interferometer like that that are of the scale of the radius of a proton. Astonishing accuracy they can achieve. But in constructing these things, they're all basing it on accepting all the assumptions about geometry. Now, obviously, when they're actually measuring gravity waves, what are they actually doing? They're measuring the divergence between the geometry of the real world and Euclidean geometry. What they get when a gravity wave goes past is a interference sh shift in the interference fringes. And that shift in the interference fringes is a shift produced because Euclidean geometry is breaking down under the, the curvature of space that's produced by the gravity wave. Um, but in order to set up the apparatus in the first place, they have to assume Euclidean geometry is right. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I have another question if no one else uh, has anything, but uh, the, 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 the ontological assumption that real numbers are, are in fact real, um, I'm wondering if you can say more about that. Is that just because there is like this material limit to um, this sort of like description of those numbers or? Well, what, what Turing says is that a real number is actually an algorithm, which when you run the algorithm will keep printing out more digits of that number. That's what we mean by a real number. Why, what do we mean by pi, which we, everyone accepts is an irrational number? Uh, when we say that's a real number, what we mean is we have several algorithms, which when we run them, will keep printing out more digits of pi as long as we wish. But at any given time, what you've got is a finite number of digits printed out. We, what makes the, the, these different from the rational numbers is that the algorithm doesn't halt. It's a non-halting algorithm. It'll go on forever producing more digits. But a real number in Turing, his, his paper is called On Computable Numbers and its relationship to the halting problem. So he's saying a computable number is actually a program which prints the number. Now, you then take the fact that he says that there are non, there are some non-computable numbers, which you can, which you can't arrive at an answer for, and it turns out that the set of computable reals is not equivalent to the set of reals defined in continuum analysis. The, the question then is, are the reals that people reason about in, in continuum maths something which can actually exist in the real world? Or can you only have those real numbers for which there exists some algorithm that will print the output. Now, if you read Chaitin, he goes beyond what Turing says and says that, in fact, um, a computable number has to have a program that's shorter than its output. Otherwise, there's no method of generating it. You're asking for an infinite amount of information to generate it. Now, on the 
Other side of it, there, there is a joke. Suppose I want to en encode all the information in the Library of Congress, okay? I look at the first um, book, I look at the first letter of it, take its ASCII code, and that gives me a number between naught and 255. So I take a meter rule and I take, for example, 43 256 of the meter rule and make a mark there. I take the second letter of the ASCII code and then make a mark that is a subdivision of 255, 1 256th of a meter. And I keep on doing this. Now, obviously, you don't have to go through very many digits of the ASCII code or very many letters of the alphabet before you're trying to make marks on your ruler that are smaller than the dimension of a proton. If you keep on going further down to the Planck length of 10 to the minus 35 meters, why is that a, a limit? Well, that's a limit because to measure any distance, you need to reflect electromagnetic radiation off it. And because of the inverse relationship between wavelength and energy, as you shrink the wavelength down and down and down, the energy of the photons goes up and up and up. Uh, as you try and encode digits in shorter and shorter distances, the energy of the photons go that you will require grows exponentially. And at 10 to the minus 34, meters, the energy of the photons is such that if you apply equals mc squared to them, their masts will curve space into a black hole. Uh, and therefore, you can't have a smaller division of space than that. So the, if you follow relativity theory and quantum theory, that is the limit to how far, how small anything can be. So you can never have an analog system that goes down to 10 to the minus 34. And since the whole universe is roughly around 10 to the, thir to the plus 34, the, the maximum range of any analog measure can't be more than 10 to the 70. But we can do calculations much more precisely than that if we use Turing's computable numbers. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't know whether anyone else is actually there. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> I don't know what makes the, the screen come on. Yeah. It, Good afternoon, you want Professor. To Sure. Sorry, Unmute did I yourself. You? Unmute, Diego. Can you can you hear me? I can now. Yes. Oh, thank you. When you state that reality is digital, is that the same as saying it is discrete? Yes. Essentially, I'm saying it's discrete, and therefore, in principle, you can approximate it to arbitrary degree of accuracy with a digital device. Okay, uh, isn't it so that observable reality is digital while mathematical statements such as the Pythagorean theorem represent a material reality that manifests itself in an imperfect, inexact manner? Because doesn't basing this argument on our current understanding of quantum physics mean that this is just a conjecture that could be proven uh, wrong? I think it's the other way around. The conjecture was that of Euclid, um, and which people accepted Euclidean conjectures as being conjectures about the real world until Einstein proved that wasn't the case. That non-Euclidean geometries actually exist and actually operate. 
and the proof of the existence of the photon was evidence that continuum solution to electromagnetic equations breaks down. It gives you the wrong answer. It says you get far too much ultraviolet light from a, a, a body at a given temperature than you actually do. And the answer was that you, d you can't have an arbitrary level that it, in, 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 in Einstein's case, he's saying energy levels can't be arbitrarily finally separated. They must be in jumps. And they, but that's just the first uh, niche. It's the first hole opened by Einstein in the continuum and the establishment of the idea that there are quantum levels in, of energy, but th it then becomes generalized. I'm going to give people a, about another couple of minutes to see if they come up with any questions. If not, I'll close it down. Ah, you, you, I, Rodrigo, do you want, sorry, who is Tiago? Do you want to say something? Yes, I'd like to make a question. Um, thank you for your lecture, Professor Paul Cockshot. My question is the following. As I understand it, the universal Turing machine is emulating what a human mathematician uh, does at his work doing calculations yeah i i wonder um in what sense can we think of the mechanical turing machine and not the concept of the turing machine but the mechanical construction of of it uh, in what sense does it resemble the mechanical construction of the brain not of the human brain only but the brain in general well clearly they are very different the question is it, they're actually made out of different substances um and the connections between them are different the the the, the conceptually interesting thing though is are the set of questions that one answers the same as a set, sorry, the set of questions that could be answered by one, the same as the set of questions that could be answered by the other. And can one emulate the other? Now, if you look at the work that uh, people like Google do, both on analyzing text, but more particularly on analyzing images, what they're doing is attempting to emulate the neural, the, the visual cortex. They're building models, mathematical models, which are based on what we understand the visual cortex to do and what we understand the general purpose learning mechanism of nervous systems to be. And once they started working using that approach, and once they started to have the computational capacity to simulate what amounts to very large numbers of neurons, then they start to be able to get artificial intelligence systems which can recognize the sorts of things we can recognize without us being able to say exactly why they do it. But the point is that this, they're doing this with a network of computers with typically GPUs attached. And they run a package called TensorFlow, which is expressing things in, in terms of abstract tensor algebras. But the structural motivation for that is to copy 
what has been learned about the mammalian visual cortex. And that turns out to be able to do these things. So what that says is that a universal Turing machine, because uh, a cluster of computers by the, at Google are a, an instance of a generalized universal computer, universal digital computer, let's say. Uh, it is a universal digital computer and it can emulate other systems which are neural systems. Now, the sheer number of neurons in mammalian brains is so large that you can only, they can only emulate relatively small parts of it. They can emulate part of the visual cortex. They can't yet emulate all the other parts of the brain. But I think it indicates that the universal principle, the principle that once a machine reaches a certain threshold of complexity, it can emulate any other machine. That is the important point. And human beings aided with pencils and paper were able to do any, in principle, any calculations. So all of science up until the time Turing wrote was done relying on human beings and pencils and papers, or in some cases with abacuses, but human beings with some additional storage age. So the universality of mathematics is, and the universality of scientific practice up until the point of Turing was based actually on doing the operations that he describes his machine as doing, except that they were done by people. And at the time he was writing, the word computer was used normally to refer to the people whose job it was to do the calculations for astronomers. Anyone else want to <laughs> you, Bryn, you look as if you're going to say something else. Uh, yeah, I just wanted, uh, just a very practical question. Um, I'm wondering if you could say something more about like the readings for next week, like, wh like what to sort of focus on. Hold on a moment. I'll, I'll have to quickly look on my other screen of my computer to see what, the, remind me what the next one. Uh, it's about modeling theory. Um, oh God. <laughs> Really, uh, you should read my book, Computation and Its Limits. Uh, the, obviously, Badia writes a bit about the theory of models, but uh, we're concentrating much more on the material embodiment of models. So, but the, the book by myself and uh, Greg Michelson, um, provides much of the basis for this, um, this section, there's the book. Uh, and I'm basing it really on, this lecture was, was based on chapter four. The, um, the coming lectures are on chapters two and three, probably. Great, thank you. Okay, lacking any further questions, I'm gonna, Count to 10, if no one puts their hand up, I'm gonna turn it off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Goodbye everyone, see you next week. <laughs>